Well, good morning, Southwestern. Oh, what a privilege it is to be with you today. It's a joy. I've looked forward to this opportunity ever since Dr. Dockery invited me to come, and I want to thank him personally for that. I've known Dr. Dockery now for 40 years. I think we met in 1983, if I remember. And uh, so he has been a friend and an encourager to me all through that time. And I'm very grateful for the privilege of returning and being here in this chapel service today. I'm delighted to see what God is doing here on the campus at Southwestern. And I'm excited to see the positive direction that Dr. Docker is leading our seminary and grateful to God to be here today. You know, more than half of my life has been spent at this school. Three years was I a student here, 1978 to 1981. Twelve years was I a board of trustee member of this institution. And then 18 years serving on her faculty. When you add all of that up, that's a little bit over one half of my life. A big part of my life and a big part of my heart is and always will be at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And so thank you for the honor and privilege of being back with you today and bringing the word of the Lord from Philippians. Turn with me there, if you would, Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, reading through verse 18. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, both to will and to work according to His good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing, but even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you in the same way you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Two words are every driver's nightmare under construction. It doesn't matter whether you're on the back streets of the town or on the highway, every driver dreads the sight and the sign that reads those two words, under construction. All of the years that I came to Southwestern as a student, all of the years I came over here for trustee meetings, and all of the years I came over here during the weeks that I, the 18 years that when I was on the faculty, I always lived over in the Dallas area and commuted, and every trip, every trip, never without exception, every trip, there was always somewhere a sign that said, under construction. If you live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you live in a town that is perpetually, the roads are perpetually under construction. In your journey to final salvation, glorification in heaven, the road will always be under construction. Every Christian wears an invisible sign, and those two words are imprinted on that sign, under construction construction. The key word in the Christian life is not perfection. The key word is progression. What God is interested in today is whether you and I are making progress in the Christian life. And that's what this passage of Scripture is all about. Now, the first thing we need to do, let's fly over at 10,000 feet and do some aerial photography. Because this paragraph falls within a section that begins in chapter 1, verse 27, and ends in verse 18 of chapter 2, and there are four paragraphs there. And I want to remind you of the continuity that Paul is developing. So in 1, 27 through 30, his command is, live your life worthy of the gospel. 
Now that is where he starts this section and that is where he ends in 2, 12 through 18. And then comes chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And there again, we find the imperatives. Make my joy complete. Think the same way. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Consider others before you consider yourself. And so paragraph number two has these staccato imperatives that are telling us how to live the Christian life. Then the author does something very surprising. In paragraph number three, two, five through 11, he gives a sermon illustration. And wouldn't you know it, amazing it is that the illustration that he gives turns out to be one of the four great Christological passages in all of the New Testament. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, all about how Jesus left heaven's glory and in humility came to where we are and there humbled himself even to the point of death. And Paul uses this marvelous illustration of the attitude and the activity of Jesus. And in verse 5 of that text, another command that drives the entire thing adopt this same attitude that was the attitude of Christ. And then comes our text linked with the therefore, verse 12, tightly connecting it to 5 through 11. Many people look at this and say, I don't really see the connection. Oh, but the connection is there. The connection is the fact that we, in light of who Jesus is, in light of what the Lord has done, it is our responsibility to live out every aspect of our Christian life on a daily basis from now until Jesus calls us home. And that's what we find in 2, 12 through 18. Now, in this larger paragraph, there are three subparagraphs. 12 and 13 go together, 14 through 16, one sentence in the Greek New Testament goes together, and finally 17 and 18. So Paul is saying to you and me today three primary things from these three paragraphs. The first thing that he's saying to us in verses 12 and 13 is work out your own salvation. Now this passage followed in verse 13 with, for it is God who's at work in you. This passage has created lots of confusion for 2,000 years. This passage has stirred up lots of controversy for 2,000 years. Now all texts have within them, or many texts have within them, theological booby traps. And if you're not careful, You'll go messing around in there and you will blow off a theological finger. And so you don't want to do that today. You want to be very, very careful. Notice Paul talks about work out your own salvation. The thing that is crucial to understand is that the Bible speaks of salvation in three tenses. You have been saved. That's justification. You are being saved. That's sanctification. Theologically, sanctification is positional, but it is also progressive. You are being saved. You have been justified, saved from the penalty of sin. You are being saved day by day by progressive sanctification from the presence and the practice and the power of sin. But one day, you will be saved from the very presence of sin. That's called glorification. And there's a major error that people make in this text, and it is this. Failure to distinguish between salvation as justification and salvation as sanctification. Paul is not talking here about salvation as justification. He is writing to believers who are already justified. And so when Paul says, work out your own salvation, he is now talking about sanctification. And that's so very crucial to get that right. The great Puritan Thomas Watson in his sermon on this text confuses those. And his sermon is very confusing because he is trying to apply these two verses, first to justification and then to sanctification. These verses don't apply to justification. They only apply to sanctification from the standpoint of progressive sanctification. So make sure you get that right first rattle out of the box. And when you do, now you can work your way through this text 
with no problem. So Paul says, work out your own salvation. And what he means is, you are responsible for your Christian growth. You are responsible for your Christian growth. Notice he says, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. Our Paul should not be human props that are necessary to keep you by their presence doing what you should be doing, whether they are present or not. You see, you and I have a responsibility. Paul says to the Christians at Philippi, hey, whether I'm with you or whether I'm not with you, in my presence, as you've always obeyed, but now in my absence, no matter what, you are to work out your own salvation. You know what Paul is saying? He's saying, don't depend on me. He's saying, don't make me your hall monitor. Don't make me stand out there in the hall and when you're late to class, say, shoot, get over there. Get on in that class. Don't make me your spiritual watchdog. No, work out your own salvation just as you've you done it in the past, in my presence, now much more in my absence. You've got to stand on your own two feet. Hey, suppose all pastors were suddenly swept away. Suppose your professors, suddenly they are swept away. Suppose your parents, if you look to them for spiritual truth and help, they are swept away. All Christian leaders are gone. How would that affect your spiritual growth? Would you keep on growing? Would you work out your salvation? You see, you can't depend on the past. You've got to look to the future. There's a reason why your windshield is 96 times larger than your rearview mirror. Whatever God has done in the past with whomever he's done it, building into your life, you've got to press on to the work of God in the future. And so there is here an activity, work out. Boy, that word in Greek is an interesting word. It's a word that is strenuous, great effort, great care. Present tense here, continually work out, regularly, daily, sustain, working out. Present imperative involves constant self-initiated activity. You're responsible for your spiritual growth. You're responsible is to work it out. And oh, by the way, in the Greek text, this verb is placed at the end of the clause for emphasis. So it's not only my presence, but absence and all of these things. He gives you that. And then comes the main point. Work it. Work out. Work out. Your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out is what Paul is saying. The interesting word, it's a word that was used to work a gold mine in order to, you go into the mine and you work it in order to get the precious ore out. It's a word that was used to work a garden. And so you do everything you do, you weed and you, you, you work in that garden in order to have the produce that comes from the garden. It's an interesting word that means from an athletic standpoint, to work as an athlete, to prepare yourself to be the very best that you can possibly be. It's a word that describes a musician who takes the composer's work. The composer has already put it there, and now the musician works that out in performance for the audience. That's the word that is used here. In fact, notice throughout these verses, this text is overloaded with the word work and the concept of work. I mean, words drip with perspiration in this text. The palm of this text has calluses everywhere because people are working. This text has a weary back from working hard as we are supposed to work. This text has bone weariness. The bones of this text are weary from hard work. Our activity is surely based on God's grace, as Paul says, but we need to go beyond wherever we've been in the past. We've got to go beyond and work out our salvation, as God says. Notice he says, work out your salvation. Guess what? The your there is plural, because Paul is talking to the Philippian congregation. Work out your salvation. There's a community aspect here. But then there's an individual aspect. Work out your own salvation. Communities are made up of individuals. And so there's an individual application. Work out your salvation. So how are you doing? 
in your work. You know, when I was in elementary school, I hated long division. Long division. The teacher would always put the problem way up high on the chalkboard because long division takes a long time and a lot of space to work out. It's long division. Divide, multiply, subtract, bring down, and repeat. Divide, multiply, subtract, bring down, and repeat. And I did not do very well in math when I was in elementary school. But one day the teacher said something to me that made the difference. She said, David, the answer is already in the problem. You just have to work it out. The answer is already in the problem. You just have to work it out. And that's what Paul is saying to you and me right here in this text of Scripture. The answer is right here. The solution is right here. God has given us this wonderful salvation, but we've got to work it out. And what does that mean? It means continuously translating the principles of the Christian life into your daily life. That's what it means. That's a 24-7 job. From now till the day the Lord calls you home, work out your own salvation. That's the action, but now there's an attitude associated with it. Notice what Paul says, with fear and trembling. The combination of those two words composing that phrase is an idiom. Fear and trembling is borrowed from the Old Testament. It's an idiom that Paul is fond of using or the New Testament writers use on occasion. And it's an idiomatic word that expresses attitude. Now, it doesn't express the fear of being so afraid in the presence of God. No, it it reflects and means the proper reverence for God in the process of working out your own salvation. It means that you are aware of who God is and who you are and the eternal consequences that are at stake. It means to work with due reverence and all, humility and vigilance. That's what's wrapped up in this phrase with fear and trembling. We do what we do living out our Christian life because of who God is, because of what's at stake, because of the seriousness of the job we have to do. And there is a quality in our obedience. Work it out with fear and trembling. That produces quality in your obedience. It produces an integrity in your obedience. It produces a humility in your obedience. Work this wonderful salvation God has given you. Work it out with fear and trembling. It, was, it is the antidote to complacency. It is the remedy for vanity. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The fear of falling keeps you from falling. Have you ever stopped to think about that? The fear that you have of falling causes you to take the steps that keep you from falling. And the same is true in your Christian life. The fear working out our salvation, but with the proper awe and respect and a fear of falling. I don't want to fall, Lord. I don't want to make a mistake, Lord. And this is what Paul is saying. You work that out, but you better pay close attention to what you're doing and you better make it the work of your life every day and every moment. You better take the Christian life seriously. Work out that salvation with fear and trembling. Becoming spiritually fit is what Paul is talking about. And that requires a plan. It requires his power, and it requires your perseverance. You are responsible for your Christian growth. But then, Paul says in verse 13, God is responsible for your Christian growth. You say, now, whoa, wait a minute. Is Paul unsaying what he said in verse 12? (laughs) Paul, which is it? What's the matter with you, Paul? Make up your mind. Is it, is it I? Am I doing it or is God doing it? Yes. You're both doing it. When it comes to progressive sanctification, God is responsible for your Christian growth. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. There are two errors you need to avoid in this text. Error number one is, I will not work at all for God works in me. No, you're not a puppet moved by the finger of God. 
You have will and volition, and you need to work out your salvation just because God is energizing you and working in you as well to help you accomplish that doesn't mean that you sit back and do nothing like a wallflower. No, work out your own salvation. God is at work. And so some say, well, I, I, won't, I don't need to work. God does it all. Other say, it's I who work, both to will and to do of God's good pleasure. It is I who work in me, both to will and to do of God, good ple- God's good pleasure. No, I'm sorry. That's a failure to give proper accountability or to give proper uh, tribute to God and his work in the process. To do that is to be like Jimmy Stewart, the actor in the movie Shenandoah. Now, all of you or most all of you are too young. You've never seen that movie, but you need to go back and watch it. At the very beginning, he is a father. He, has a, he, he lives on a farm. He's got seven children in the Shenandoah Valley of, of Virginia. And they're about to st- sit down at the dinner table. And all the kids are there. They're all grown now. And the children are there. And he's at the head of the table. And so he says the prayer. And his prayer goes like this. Lord, we cleared this land. We sowed it. We harvested it. We cooked the harvest. It wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be eating it if we hadn't done it all ourselves. We worked dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel. But we thank you nevertheless, Lord, for this food we're about to eat. Amen. That was his prayer. You know, that's sort of like some Christians. It's more what I do and it's less what... God does. No, salvation is an inside job. God is the one who works. God is the energizer. He's the working one. God is constantly present tense, working in your life. And because God works, you work. (laughs) Grace does not exempt you from working. Grace does not shield you from working. You have a responsibility to work out what God has already worked in in his wonderful salvation. And then God himself is responsible for your Christian growth by working that in and giving you the opportunity and the resources you and I need to work out our own salvation. And notice Paul says, Work that out both to will and to do, both to will and to work. It's another word for work. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is what God is doing in you. Look at that, both to will and to work. Let me ask you a question. What is God's will? Well, Paul says there are two biggies related to God's will. The first aspect of God's will is God desires the salvation of all people. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4 tells us, that God wants all people to be saved. That's the desire of God. That's the will of God. And number two in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, God, Paul said this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So God desires and wills two things. Now he desires and wills many more things, but there are two things God desires. Number one, the salvation of all people. And number two, the sanctification of those who are saved. That is God's will. And that's what this text is all about. When you were in science class, do you remember studying about potential energy and kinetic energy? The rock at the top of the hill sitting on the cliff has potential energy. But when that rock is rolled off and that rock goes into motion and gravity comes into play and pulls that rock to the ground, that energy is converted from potential energy to kinetic energy. Your Christian life is the same way. God has given you salvation that is in you, but now it's time for you to work it out. It's time for your potential Christian life to become actual living of the Christian life. Bodies in motion working out for God. And basically what that means here, what Paul is saying is he's causing you, God causes you to desire to do what God wants you to do. And then God enables you to do what God wants you to do. How can you lose? You can't lose in a situation like that. What a deal. God says, work it out. Well, Lord, okay. And God gives you all of these tools and resources. He gives you his word. He gives you his Holy Spirit to indwell you. He gives you the opportunity of prayer. He gives you a local church to stand beside you. And so many other things does God do to help you fulfill this text of Scripture. Work out your own salvation for it's God who's at work in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Look at that last phrase, for his good pleasure. 
What's your approval rating with God today? Does God look at you and your Christian life, your progress, whatever you're doing to work out your Christian life? And is God pleased? He's doing all this for his good pleasure. What's your approval rating with God? So number one, Paul says, work out your own salvation. Let's summarize it in two words. Work it. Work it. Now, Paul says, that's the general principle. Now, let's get personal. Now, let's get specific about how you do that. And so, in verses 14 through 16, Paul says, in order to do that, we're going to stop whining and we're going to start shining. We're going to stop whining and we're going to start shining. Look at it, verses 14 through 16. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine. It's probably an imperative there. The, the, the word itself grammatically can be either an indicative or an imperative, and likely it's an imperative. Shine like stars in the world. How? Participle of means by holding forth and holding firm the word of life. What's Paul saying? After he tells us to work out your own salvation, he says, let's give a couple of illustrations and let's put it into practice. Stop your whining and start shining. The first command, work out your own salvation, that deals with the vertical relationship of you and God. But now comes the horizontal relationship of how this works out and applies to other people. And so from general principle to specific, Paul says, do all things without murmuring and without arguing about it. The necessity of all times and in all circumstances and all situations, no wiggle room, do all things without murmuring and without arguing. This phrase, the concept here of murmuring, is probably Paul's way of echoing the Exodus generation in the Old Testament. Because you can't help but notice over and over again how we, it is recorded in the book of Exodus that over and over the people of God in that Exodus generation griped and grumbled and murmured against Moses. And by the way, 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, Paul says there, do not murmur as some of them did in the Exodus generation and were destroyed in the wilderness. Hey, God takes murmuring seriously. God takes complaining seriously. I wonder if God killed off all the murmurers among us, how many of us would make it after chapel to the student center? Do all things without murmuring. It's an onomatopoetic word. You say, what? Say that too fast, you'll lose your dentures. It just means that's a word that sounds like what it means. The word in Greek sounds like what it means. And it's a word that the original meaning of the word had to do with the cooing of doves. Have you ever heard, have you ever listened to the doves as they coo? Oh, oh, oh. They make that little cooing sound. That's what murmuring is like. And Paul says, do all things without moaning and muttering and murmuring about it. Great is the cloud of murmurers among us. The devil's playground is filled with people who are grumblers, gripers, and complainers, chronic complainers. Don't be that way. Can you, did you see what Dr. Yarnell put in his syllabus? How many Hundreds of pages we have to read from that systematic theology book. Can you believe Dr. Kreider is making us sight read that incredibly difficult piece of music? Can you believe that Dr. Queen is making us color three books instead of two in his class? Why? Can't believe it. 
Grumbling, griping, complaining, murmuring. Oh, no, seminary students don't do that, do they? No. When I was in my first church, I had a grumbler. He was a constant griper and complainer. You know, in those days, we'd have our monthly business meetings. I was a young pastor, and I would say, well, you know what? In our church today, we need to, our office church, we need to buy 10 pencils. An old boy would stand up and say, well, I don't believe we need 10 pencils. I think we can get by with four. There's people that are always grumbling and griping. You know what I'm saying. These are people that are born in the objective case in the kickative mood. These are people that when they die, God's going to have to install a suggestion box in heaven for them. I mean, these are people that if they drown, you better look for them upstream. They're against everything. You know the kind of people I'm talking about, and that's what Paul is talking about. Get rid of that. Don't do any of that. Get that out of your system. Quit grumbling and griping and complaining. I learned that early on because I was the first staff member ever hired by Prestonwood Baptist Church when she was a mission church of less than 100 people in 1977. And my job description was only half a page long. But here's what the pastor required. Monday, all day in the church office, eight hours. Tuesday through Thursday, 1.30 in the afternoon to 5 p.m., you can go to seminary from 8 to 12, which I did, and then the hour drive back and get lunch, and then 1.30 to 5, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday night, working with the students, I was the student pastor. And then on Friday, I got the day off. But on Saturday, I was required to do four hours of visitation on Saturday. And then, of course, all day on Sunday morning, be there three hours, nine to 12. And evening, be there the two hours plus any youth activities afterward. And on Saturday night at 7 p.m., Billy Weber, the pastor, required me to call him on the phone, tell him how many visits I'd made that week, how many I thought we would have in youth Sunday school, and how many teenagers were going to join the church that Sunday. And all of that, I made $400 a month. And so I got a little, after two or three months of that, Dr. Dockery, I began to get a little, I got a little grumbling and mumbling and complaining. And then God just got all over me. And he said, son, you're doing what you do for me. Whatever they require you to do, you do that with the right heart. And you know, today I look back on that, and that created in me a worth ethic and helped me in preparation for future ministry. And so whether it's a class here or an overpowering pastor somewhere, you're on his staff, or whatever the case may be, do what you do without grumbling and without arguing about it. Some people turn everything into a controversy. That's all they know how to do. Paul knew that, and that's why he says, quit grumbling and quit arguing about stuff. Don't waste your energy on incidentals because that will keep you from being able to accomplish the essentials. So without griping and grumbling. And then he says, so that you might be blameless and pure, two adjectives stressing the reputation of our life inside, internal and external, as well as within the church and outside of the church, blameless and pure, purity internally, blameless, external, children of God, faultless in a crooked and perverted generation. My soul, if ever anybody ever lived in a crooked or perverted generation, it's got to be ours. But learn a little bit about in your New Testament introduction class and figure out what the world was like when Paul walked on this earth and you will decide it was just as crooked and you will discover it was just as crooked and just as perverted as it is today. Among whom you live. Children of God, we're children of God, right? Don't forget that. Who are faultless in a crooked and a perverted generation. That phrase, crooked and perverted, is also an idiomatic phrase. It comes from the Old Testament, and Paul is borrowing it and bringing it into the New Testament. A crooked and a perverted generation was the description God gave to his wilderness children, his covenant people who were constantly grumbling and griping about him. God said, you are a crooked and perverted generation. (laughs) You know, it points off when God says that about you. But now he's saying, look, you live, you Christians, we live in a crooked and a perverted generation. 
Listen, you'll be blamed, but you can be blameless, according to Paul. They couldn't pick holes in Daniel's character or his conduct. And the only way they could get old Daniel in the book of Daniel is if they got him on something related to his walk with God, specifically his prayer life. King, he's praying too much. He's breaking the law. Children of God, faultless in a crooked and perverted generation. Paul continues. This is all one sentence in the Greek New Testament. Among whom you shine. This is an allusion to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. Among whom you shine as lights in a dark world. Each Christian is a luminary. You're a light. Matthew 5, 14, what did Jesus say? You are the light of the world. (laughs) Let that light shine. What do lights do? They make visible is one thing they do. They guide, number two. And number three, they warn. Now, they do other things, but lights make visible, guide, and warn. Aren't you grateful? You are the light of the world. Now, Jesus is the light of the world, but you and I are to shine as lights, Paul says, reflecting the light of the Lord, the Son, S-U-N and S-O-N, and then we reflect that light as we live in the midst of a dark generation. So my question to you is, are you a 40-watt bulb or a 100-watt bulb today? The world needs a 100-watt bulb. Or better still, how about you be a lighthouse instead of a lightning bug? Among whom you shine. Holding forth, participle of means, how do you shine? By holding forth, the Greek phrase here means either holding fast or holding forth. And you pick 12 commentaries and six will go that way and six will go that way. And so I'm just going to tell you today, it means both. So hold fast and hold forth. That's how you shine. Both meanings are probably tied up in the word which gives life. And you and I are the ones who share that good news with others as we live in this world and as we work out our own salvation. Sin rules with a cruel tyranny. Business operates on the basis of shenanigans and selfishness. Fraud is widespread sexual immorality and deviancy and perversion is all around us. May God give us Christian statesmen who are points of light in the political darkness. May God give us Christian businessmen and Christian businesswomen who shine like lights as according to this text, who shine as torchbearers in the economic darkness. May God give us Christian educators who are floodlights in the twilight of our culture. And may God give us Christian preachers who are not intoxicated with the limelight and who rather are presenting the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we need. And Paul says... Do all that so I can brag about you when I stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul immediately moves to an eschatological perspective. And Paul says, hey, I want you to do this so I can boast on the day of Christ. The day of Christ, that's a theological phrase and term that refers to the second coming of the Lord and the end times, and particularly here in this context, even to the judgment seat of Christ, because we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of how we worked out our salvation. And so Paul is not conceited and boasting about anything he's done. No, he's boasting about what God's done. So on that day, I can boast that I haven't run or labored in vain. Throughout the Pauline letters, you will find the words run. Paul will talk about running. Paul will talk about laboring. Those are his two favorite words to describe his ministry and especially in context at the end so that when he stands before Jesus, he will not run or have labored in vain. So, point number two, we've got to hurry. You know what Paul is saying? Shut it. Shut it and shine it. And then comes number three. Rejoice and rejoice with me. Twice in these last two verses does Paul use the imperative, rejoice and rejoice with me. 
Paul talks about his life being like a drink offering. Numbers 15 verses 1 through 10 talk about that. The offering was laid on the altar and then sometimes the sacrificial, the one making the sacrifice would bring a, a goblet of wine or a jar of wine and would pour that. That was a drink offering on top of the rest of the offering. Paul says, I watch your life and I'm grateful for you. And when we all get to heaven and whenever it's my time to come, if I am martyred, if my day is near, if I'm poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, Paul says, hey, I rejoice and you rejoice. And Paul says, you rejoice and you rejoice with me. Here is a double dose and a double dip of joy right out of this passage of Scripture. When I get my ice cream, I like a double dip. And Paul says you got a double dip of joy. At the Battle of Marathon, 490 B.C., the Persians were attacking the Greeks. And the battle raged and the Greeks held off the Persians and won the battle. And Pheidippus, so the story goes, ran from the battlefield of Marathon 25 miles approximately to Athens to inform the waiting leaders of the city of the victory. And when he got there, he fell in exhaustion before them, and he uttered the words, Rejoice, we've won. And then he died. Paul is saying, I'm ready. If I'm, if I'm offered, if I'm martyred, if I give my life for the gospel, Paul says, I rejoice, and you rejoice with me. We've got a double dose and double dip of joy. So 17 and 18, you want it summed up again in two words, rejoice it. Rejoice it. Work it, shut it, shine it, rejoice it. God has given you a skyscraper foundation. Don't build a shack on it. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. Give Jesus your all. Take from Jesus all he has to give you. Don't stand before the judgment seat of Christ and press into the nail-scarred hands the charred embers of a wasted life. Don't do that. When Ruth was driving a few years ago in North Carolina, she came across a stretch of road where she saw that sign under construction. And for the next several miles, twists and turns and slowing down and bumps in the road and all that goes along with that, frustrating to no end to Ruth. And then she came at the end of the construction zone and she saw a sign that said, construction Finished, thank you for your patience. That struck her, and she ruminated on that. And when she got home, she told her husband, Billy, when I die, that's my epitaph. That's what I want on my tombstone. And so today, if you go to the Billy Graham Library and to the gardens, you'll find the tombstone of Ruth Bell Graham, the wife of evangelist Billy Graham. And on the top of that tombstone is the Chinese character, righteousness. And underneath are written the words, construction finished, thank you for your patience. Decide what you want written on your tombstone and then work backwards from there and live your life for Jesus. Get to work, stop your whining, and rejoice, we win.